Let me turn to Vladimir Milov, focusing on economic reform. But I would like to add that if you look at the, uh, the report in front of you, <laughs> there is a very interesting exchange at the end where Vladimir <laughs> comments upon uh, Andrei's uh, uh, remarks and, and, and projects for constitutional reform, and then Andrei comments upon <coughs> Vladimir's comments, which is a great way to illustrate the plurality of ideas, but still agreeing on the basics. I mean, that's important to keep in mind. But now, first on economics, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you very much, Roland. And it's always good to have a good debate, uh, which is something we're lacking in Russia uh, on the general political scene. So I want to thank the Free Russia Foundation for this idea of uh, summarizing what the opposition has to say about uh, potential Russia's future. Uh, and it's always great to be here at the Martin Center among friends uh, with whom we share a common European democratic values. Uh, I'm happy to be a frequent guest here. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to say will reflect our previous discussions about the need to decentralize Russia in a lot of ways. But I have to start uh, saying that we uh, launched this report yesterday at the Chatham house in London, and the first thing we discovered is that people get mesmerized with this after Putin part in, in the uh, title. People start to say, wow, did I miss something overnight? <laughs> uh, should, should I go to my Twitter account to see the news, right? <laughs> but but uh, as a matter of fact, this report is not exactly about that. Uh, it is not about uh, the way we get there. It is not about some tactical political developments and uh, strategy of uh, opposition and its uh, political activity. It's more about the vision of the country's future. And I think it was, it's fairly necessary to have this paper at the moment and uh, more importantly, further debate on, on uh, these issues. Because uh, one of the biggest accusations uh, from the Russian government and from Vladimir Putin against the opposition is that uh, we don't have the constructive agenda. So here's the answer that you get. Yes, we do. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, it's much better than wh what Vladimir Putin and his cronies have to offer. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, we are right now at the point where Putin is about to reach uh, uh, 20 years in power. That's a long time. And uh, he still, uh, for those of you who have been uh, looking at his uh, television address on the 29th of August regarding raising the retirement age, it's pretty clear that one thing, uh, when you always listen to Vladimir Putin, uh, he still prefers to talk about the 90s, uh, which were terrible, and uh, we're still are facing the consequences. But I think every uh, reasonable, conscious man would say, look, 20 years in power is a long time. You could have at least tried to do something. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the only thing that Vladimir Putin did over, over uh, this period was centralizing power. Uh, political power, economic power, media power. So uh, virtually, this was always explained uh, that we need to do this for a purpose, that when we centralize power, life will get better somehow. But I think now we nearly centralized almost everything. Uh, uh, this year uh, brought us the news that uh, big state structures are already buying over private retailers, small telecom companies. So here is where already the state has, the, 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 the deep state has, Russian, deep Russian state has penetrated. Uh, but the improvements are not there. Uh, and uh, uh, to start with, uh, we are uh, right now entering a second decade without economic growth. Russian economy at the moment is still at the size of 2008. Uh, we have this very heated debate about uh, uh, raising the retirement age, which is obviously the issue number one in Russia at the moment. And during this debate, Vladimir Putin and uh, his government always refer uh, to the example of uh, Western countries uh, who have much higher retirement age than Russia. And they say, well, we, we, everybody does that. We need to follow uh, their example. Now, we always respond that, look, let's stop right here for a moment, because the first thing is that was happening uh, in the recent years in the Western countries is that the governments who did not deliver economic growth were wiped out at the free and fair competitive elections. So let's maybe start with that. And the solution to pension problems uh, basically would uh, eventually come during the open uh, political debate. But uh, generally, I have to say, uh, Roland, you remember we uh, many times here uh, when I came and we discussed the present and the future of Russia, we discussed this general idea of decentralization of powers. 
So I think this is exactly the opposite of, uh, of Vladimir, what Vladimir Putin has been doing over 20 years. He's been centralizing powers just for the sake of uh, centralization. During that process, uh, Putin had discovered that it's also very beneficial economically for him and his ruling clan, because many people who uh, earned uh, barely a few hundred thousand euros in 99 became uh, one of the biggest global billionaires. And Russia is right now in the top three countries of the world uh, by the number of billionaires and uh, uh, by the concentration of accumulated wealth. Uh, by strange coincidence, that I, I'm sure they're all very talented people by themselves, but there is a strange coincidence that most of them used to work with Vladimir Putin at some time in the 90s with, in St. Petersburg administration or uh, around it. Uh, and uh, uh, basically that's the only achievement we have uh, because we're still trailing behind uh, most developed countries in, in human development, in the quality of healthcare. Uh, we recently published a report about the results of Putin's years in power together with Ilya Yashin, and it's also translated, and maybe some of you have read it, but it's uh, basically available. I think it's available in English online. At the Free Russia website, uh, uh, most definitely, I strongly advise that uh, you should look at it. For instance, uh, since 2000, when Putin first came to power, he talked about the need to diversify Russian economy away from oil dependence and uh, uh, develop uh, high-tech, high-added value sectors as an alternative to dependence on exports on oil and gas. Now, as a matter of fact, after 20 years, dependence on exports of oil and gas grew by all reasonable merits. A uh, second thing is that in this report, put in the results, we mention uh, a thing which surprises a lot of people in Russia because they just don't look at these rankings, but uh, we have been always proud by the quality of Soviet education which is, I mean, that's a questionable topic in itself, but it's like a very popular notion in Russia that, well, we might have a lot of problems, but it's still we have a good education a system that is inherited from, from the Soviet Union. Now, uh, we illustrate that Russia currently occupies position number 50-50 in the uh, 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 ranking of uh, countries by the quality of... Uh, uh, middle-age uh, education, uh, is we're trailing behind countries like India, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, uh, which is actually a striking development, and we have been falling down. Uh, that can be clearly seen by the results of the graduating exams in Russian schools, that the quality of education has been rapidly deteriorating in the past uh, 10 years. We're trailing behind developed countries by two or three times uh, by the uh, level of spending on healthcare and education as a share of GDP. Uh, for past 20 years, we have been talking about the major uh, infrastructure development, but we're still uh, trailing behind a country like Finland two times by the total length of high-speed freeways, uh, which is ridiculous for a big country like Russia. And uh, we're down uh, about four times as compared to 2000 by the total length of new roads uh, introduced uh, each year, uh, this is a figures for 2017, disregard of the fact that we spend a record num uh, amount of money on road construction, 1.5 trillion rubles last year, that is an absolute record uh, for, for all the years. So uh, uh, no matter where you look, there's this deep, deep inefficiency, and the big question is hanging in the air, what did Vladimir Putin actually deliver uh, over 20 years? Uh, he doesn't like to talk about it, uh, but we still want to bring people, people's attention to uh, the fundamental fact that this overly centralized system that he built is flawed, because it doesn't allow debate uh, about policy issues, policy ideas, uh, and uh, uh, it doesn't allow to use a democratic process to pick the best ones and the best practices. It doesn't allow to expose, expose corruption, uh, which eats up all this massive budget spending, which is expected to develop infrastructure, but in the end of the day ends up with increased number of billionaires and no real delivery with uh, infrastructure development. And so on. I mean, uh, I can go with this critique for forever, but uh, I wanted to say a few words about this paper. This paper actually uh, tries to summarize uh, the vision uh, that was outlined by absolutely different Russian uh, liberal opposition groups and parties. Uh, and one thing uh, which is quite remarkable, uh, and we actually, we do not mean it to be a Bible of economic reforms, rather than an invitation for further debate, uh, because some people would uh, 
uh, want to correct it or present their vision of a summary. But I think uh, one thing which is very visible from this paper is that uh, people often criticize Russian opposition for being fragmented and fractured. But as a matter of fact, in terms of most ideas, we really have a lot in common. And also, uh, many different groups have a similar vision of this decentralized state where uh, there is more room for open debate, uh, where there is more real influence on power for the ordinary Russians, something which they are totally lacking at the moment. And uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Miduševsky uh, was correctly saying that we do really have like a, a referendum type of system on the top person in power once in six years, right? And everything else, just take a look at the upcoming uh, regional and local elections to be held on a single election uh, day this upcoming Sunday on the 9th of September. Virtually all independent candidates who were announcing that they're running were banned. So only those who say big yes to Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin were allowed on the ballot. And those who not even say no, but offer even remote critique of what he's doing, everybody was banned. So essentially what this means is uh, that Russians are really denied free choice, free policy choice at all levels, federal, regional, local. So one thing we uh, have to offer is uh, give this choice back to the people which will be good for the policy, good for uh, open di discussion on uh, various policy ideas. Uh, and also we need to sp uh, basically shift the priorities in government focus away from uh, amassing huge resources and uh, power for uh, uh, military, paramilitary security services and all kinds of siloviki that uh, you so rapidly expanding under Putin. Uh, we also want to reprioritize the government focus away from massive spending of taxpayers' money to actually shifting towards spending more on human capital, human development, and uh, the healthcare and education, which are in uh, absolutely dire straits at the moment, and uh, it needs to be completely rebuilt after uh, Putin's 20 years in power. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I am a person who travels Russia a lot. Uh, just in the past couple of months, I've been through eight years from Kaliningrad to Krasnoyarsk, and uh, I spoke there at the rallies against raising uh, retirement age, and we really do have a lot of feedback from the ground, from grassroots and uh, from ordinary Russians. You can even see it reflected in the official opinion polls uh, that uh, the, the biggest, uh, the most important things that uh, Russian people want are really not being addressed by the authorities. Because if, if you see this hit parade, uh, for instance, like geopolitics and foreign policy issues, you would barely find them in the top 30 of the issues that uh, uh, Russian people are interested in. They're mostly interested in fixing social and economical situation, uh, establishing control over uh, permanent monopolistic growth of prices, fixing health care and education, solving the pension problem, which, which is something that government uh, is uh, really not focused on doing. As you see, uh, Putin has been solely focused on his geopolitical affairs uh, in the past years. So this refocusing on fixing the domestic situation is uh, something that uh, is really uh, welcomed and very well met by the ordinary Russians when we talk to them. They say, yes, 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 this is what we want to hear about. We want to hear about the solutions, about uh, uh, political forces which may deliver, finally, something on that. And I also have to say that this became exposed during this, uh, well, I thought about saying debate about uh, raising retirement age, but we don't have real debate on this, unfortunately. And uh, we have something which is uh, nominally called a parliament, uh, which is State Duma, where they basically, uh, the Kremlin administration had not only forced the majority that represents the ruling United Russia Party to unanimously vote for raising retirement age, but they also keep firing a few dissenters within the ruling party, who just, the main crime was that they didn't show up at this gathering when they were forced to unilaterally vote for. Some of them didn't show up, and they are right now uh, sacking them from their official uh, positions, like the deputy speaker, Zelizniak, who was a very prominent pro-Putin guy, but he didn't vote for raising retirement age. Now he's being fired from his position, just for that, right? So that's the kind of debate uh, we have. Obviously, the critics of uh, the raising retirement age are not allowed onto television and something, but uh, uh, Putin and his government keep saying that there is really no alternative to raising pension age. But yes, there is. 
Yes, there is. And we also, we devote in this brochure, uh, we devote a sizable part towards the pension policy because that's becoming a really uh, a major social economic uh, crisis at the moment uh, connected with the pension system. And we actually list uh, the ways on how to fix this problem without addressing, uh, prematurely addressing the retirement age issue uh, because we first need to invest in healthcare so and uh, uh, fix the environmental situation so that Russians uh, are not like totally ill or incapacitated uh, after 60, because uh, the official statistics is that uh, more than half of Russians uh, reaching the, the age of 55 for women and 60 for men have chronic diseases, and about 25, 30% of them are not capable of performing the uh, uh, eight hours a day uh, working time. That's official. It's not invented. It's the official... Uh, Russian estimates. So we're simply not physically ready for raising retirement age. We need to fix that first. There is enough money for that, and we clearly explain where to get it from. Uh, but generally, uh, uh, going back to the uh, the overall idea of vision for Russia, we see a far more decentralized uh, country on all levels, with big powers devolved, not only from the federal center to regions and municipalities, but also creation of a real independent judiciary. Something which, you know, I wouldn't say that it existed when Putin came to power, some prototype at best. But Putin had completely destroyed it, and uh, I would again refer to the Global Competitiveness Index by the World Economic Forum. Uh, Russia is ranked number 90 uh, uh, in, in the list of countries by uh, independence of judiciary. That's a shame. Uh, uh, this is actually one of the major obstacles, going back to the debate about economic growth, this is one of the major obstacles for investment. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, it, it is a very serious obstacle because one of the figures which people do not often hear, but it's striking. After all these years, you know uh, what is the percentage of accumulated foreign direct investment stock from G7 countries plus China? Uh, it's just 3% of Russian GDP, less than $50 billion, which is nothing. As a matter of fact, uh, Russia has absolutely failed to attract foreign direct investment during Vladimir Putin's rule, and uh, most nominal foreign direct investment that you see in statistics are coming from the offshore places like Bahamas, Bermuda, British Virgin Islands, which is basically the reprocessed uh, Russian money. So independent judiciary matters, and it's also important part important part of uh, reforms that we suggest. And also economic decentralization because the system focused on a handful of uh, big state monopolies is clearly inefficient and it turned out to be not capable of delivering uh, sustained economic growth. Now, to sum up, I have to say that, yes, obviously, politically, it can be a long way to go from where we are to a post-Putin uh, reality. But what we list in this brochure are things that are desperately needed. Uh, and this is actually a very important uh, agenda that we need to take and go and deliver to the Russian people, talk to them and explain that if they want real improvements, they should support a totally different political system and political forces which are uh, offering a real alternative, basically summarized in this paper. And if this uh, overly centralized system, which is not motivated to deliver in any way, if it persists, then we will see no growth, no improvements in healthcare and education. We will only see increased taxes. We'll see increased retirement age. And basically, uh, people will have less money, uh, but the government will have more capability to perform whatever geopolitical affairs they want, uh, strength and further strengthen uh, control. That's just one last thing. For instance, you know that Putin recently established the so-called National Guard, Rosguardia, the, the, the sole purpose of which is a crackdown on its own population, which might be unhappy with what the government is doing. The, just the federal budget allocated for this year for National Guard, 225 billion rubles. It is the only thing would be sufficient to shut down the issue of raising retirement age. So just abolish the National Guard, whose sole purpose is to crack down on ordinary Russians, 
and give this money to the pension fund. Bang, problem solved. When uh, at the same time Putin on TV is saying that uh, there is no other way, there is no other alternative, yes there is, and we try to sum up this alternative in this paper, and uh, I suggest that you read it and we welcome uh, any further debate. Thanks to both of our presenters. Um, before We still have half an hour left, uh, so that means you have to be really brief. But before we start, um, I have a provocative question. Okay, if I take this report and I try to read it with a, from a Putinist perspective, I admit that's a hard act, but I can try. So I'm a Putinist. I take this paper and I say, you're trying to make Russia a Western liberal democracy. Now, you know what Stalin is supposed to have said about introducing communism in Poland. He said something to the effect of communism fits Poland like a saddle on a cow or something. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, from Putinist perspective, they may say, yeah, well, France, Britain, Germany, US, that's one story. But Russia is different. Russia needs centralization of power, vertical. Russia needs... Um, you know, a certain power elite that decides things for the good of the people, because otherwise you'll have chaos, instability, maybe even civil war, or something like that. So, and besides that, if, again, if I was Putinist, I would also say Western liberal democracy is being doubted in the West at this very moment, and you're trying to tell us that this is the best for Russia? How would you respond to this? First you, Vladimir, and then Andrei. Uh, well, uh, Roland, this is a very classical uh, propaganda move, uh, so that when, to avoid discussing real issues, people start imposing cliches. I may as well call you a, a representative of a detached cosmopolitan globalist bureaucracy in Brussels, right? I thought it <laughs> but let's... <laughs> But let's, I mean, if we have a serious conversation here, I mean, uh, we always, when we talk to ordinary Russians, we try to bring it down to issues. Because, of course, Putin would like impose cliches on us. But we say, look, guys, uh, would you want to have a right to directly elect your regional governors or city mayors or heads of districts without any filters? Even during the happiest Putin's years, a uh, healthy two-thirds of the population said, yes, we want, to we want direct elections. We don't want it to be abolished for any abstract good or whatever, right? Important thing, which Tommy had mentioned, uh, during the worst years of uh, Putin's propaganda against uh, Western democracies, about two-thirds of Russians always said that we still want a reconciliation with the West. So we asked them a question. Do you want to have normal relations with the civilized world? Yes, we, we want normal relations. You want to have sanctions removed? Yes, we want to have sanctions removed. Then you go uh, economy-wise. You ask folks, do you like monopolies or do you prefer competition? Guess what the answer will be? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer, right? And do you like the system when just a handful, a dozen of bigger state monopolies control everything? So you have a situation when you come into a, a small provincial town and what you see is a shiny new building of uh, a local branch of Gazprom, a shiny new building of a uh, local branch of Russian railways, a shiny new building of a local branch of Sberbank, and even more luxurious building of a local branch of a pension fund. <laughs> I'm sorry. And you just got three meters away, and everything is as broken as uh, in the beloved uh, 90s by uh, Vladimir Putin, right? So uh, do you like that? or you want this money to be distributed more evenly, right? Obviously, you like increased taxes? No, people say, so uh, we, if, if we are, to, uh, we are uh, a bit skilled in talking to ordinary people about these issues, so as a matter of fact, uh, we switch this conversation to an issue by issue basis, and at the end of the day, when you tick all the boxes, right, in this questionnaire, <laughs> The bottom line is the answer is that people don't like Putin's system, no matter how you call it. Mm. Making Russia great again versus a rotten Western-type liberal democracy, that's all fine. But the questionnaire tells you a different story. This is how it goes. Thanks very much. Time for questions and remarks from you. They have to be brief, though. Um, and we start with Daniel Mitov from Bulgaria. Roland, thank you very collect. much. And, uh, 
thank you. Uh, thanks to Martin Center for organizing this, to uh, Free Russia Foundation. Uh, Vladimir, as always, very articulate. Uh, touched upon all the things. Um, just just couple of uh, couple of points. Uh, it is very um, indicative when um, when when you receive um, sensation of what uh, what a lot of people think uh, in a society of their of their government through jokes. And very and recently, I heard a recycled Soviet joke, which makes me think that. Uh, it is time to talk on the topic right now, and it's the the joke. Very shortly, is that there's a man every every morning goes through the newspaper stands, looks looks at the at the headlines of all the newspapers, and walks walks away disappointed. Uh, does that every morning? At some point, the seller of the uh, at the newspaper stand says, "Well, what are you looking at?" And you're not not buying newspapers at all. Uh, man says, "Well, I'm looking for an obituary." I said, well, the, the obituaries are on, the, on page 13. He says, no, no, the one I'm looking for will be on page one, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so uh, this, is, this is a recycled uh, Soviet joke which came back recently. And it's very indicative where a lot of people are uh, in Russia. Uh, the biggest question to me is what should be done and what kind of changes need to be done uh, what measures need to be taken uh, in a, in a post-Putin period with the uh, overly grown, um, overblown um, Siloviki apparatus with the state security um, uh, funded um, security apparatus, which right now has taken a life of its own to protect the regime. We know very well uh, that the Russian constitution pre um, uh, prevents uh, the, the um, uh, security services from um, provoking and entrapping Russian citizens into crime. And recently we witnessed the case where they did exactly that by creating a fake opposition structure, Nove Vilicie, entrapping a few, a few young people into believing that this is an anti-regime uh, an anti-regime structure and prosecuting them right now. Those are 17, 18, 19 year old kids. Uh, even if the constitution specifically um, forbids this, there's no consequences for the people from the FSB who have done this. Uh, we, we see what Rosgvardi is doing, we, we see what, uh, what others uh, are doing. And we know that one of the mistakes after the, uh, the fall of the communist regimes was not dismantling enough the former state security communist services and letting them control part of the financial, uh, of the financial, um, of the stolen money, let's put it this way, during the, the communist regimes. Uh, I, I, I would be happy to, to know how would you tackle that. Great, thanks very much. Let's continue. We have Madam right here on the right. Marie Mandras from Sciences Po University in Paris. Um, I first have to disagree very strongly with what André Medushevsky said about uh, France under de Gaulle. I'm a French citizen. <laughs> and um, I think it, it's just important never to agree with the Putinist propaganda, which is that, after all, we're all the same. Okay? Uh, de Gaulle... Uh, changed his mind over Algeria and went for the independence of Algeria. He understood that um, he was really out of touch with society after May 68, and he left power after he lost a referendum. So I think if we start not being uh, clear enough about the major difference between a democratic regime with all its, you know, uh, weaknesses and, and a non-democratic regime that resorts to violence against its own citizens and against citizens outside its own borders, then why are we here? So um, I feel very strongly about this. Now my question is uh, really to Vladimir. Um, of course we agree with you, Vladimir. You know, things are bad and they're probably not going to get any better as long as the Putin system is in power. So I'd like to go back to your post-Putin
Putin-Russia, which I think is absolutely key. We should all think in terms of post-Putin-Russia. My question is the following. Can you engage in a political, economic, social fight for reforms as long as Putin is in power? In other words, can we envisage a Russia with Putin, but already a post-Putin Russia? And practically, how do you do it, Vladimir? Great question. We'll collect a couple of more. Uh, we have two gentlemen here on the right. I'm a defense attaché uh, of Embassy of Ukraine in Belgium, uh, Major General Bulgakov. I have uh, a question. Uh, key con uh, what concern the place of uh, Ukrainian question, uh, annexion of the Crimea, aggression, uh, Russians' aggression in the east of Ukraine, in uh, the Russians' uh, future. Uh, your vision. Thank you. Stasinopoulos, uh, formerly with the European Commission. Uh, I have spent the last 30, 35 years of my life in Europe. Before I was in Canada with the Canadian government and dealing with the United States. And so my whole life has been looking at uh, international relationship in a wider global context. Certainly, uh, the feeling in Europe is that uh, Russia under Putin is, uh, presents a lot of difficulties because uh, Putin is disrupting ge the geopolitics. Eh? There is no doubt about that. Also, he is very pleased to be considered as a disruptor of liberal economy. And all of us in Europe would like to see Russia moving into somehow a freer system. And I would like to thank both the two presenters for very valuable, let's say, contribution. But we cannot deny, of course, that in Russia right now finds a degree of sympathy in parts of Europe. Eh? I'm, I'm not going to go into that. Certainly, one aspect is Many people, especially young people in Europe, and I have been traveling a lot, they see, unfortunately, Putin as a welcome challenge to a US-led global order. Uh, we're going now to into somehow difficult uh, and, uh, concepts, of course. Um, and then coming back to now to, to the question of uh, what the path for the post-Putin era. Uh, my question is, for the two presenters, uh, rapporteurs, D do you think that uh, somehow, okay, ideally is the, the development of Russia's economy and democracy should be based exclusively, the Russians should decide, but we live in a very uh, interconnected global economic environment, certainly, and uh, to what extent you think the attitude or the position of of the Western countries, Europe and the United States, or even <laughs> the position of China, eh, which we cannot, would affect the path of Russia or the, the speed with which you are going to reach uh, that ideal state of, of a better, a freer environment. Thank you. And we have our Polish colleague right here. I am not only from Poland, Marek Dombrowski, I also teach in Higher School of Economics in Moscow. I am, three comments. First, I perfectly understand that for opposition is not easy to speak about increasing retirement age and even more support this kind of reform. But being in the, your shoes, I would be extremely happy if the current regime was able to, to complete this reform. I'm not sure that uh, it will happen because when I uh, uh, watched President Putin's address last week, I, my, my feeling was that this not only tactical backtracking, but pr I don't exclude that this will be 
put on hold this reform because of the political fears, but frankly speaking, I don't see any alt uh, alternative ways to, given the demography, uh, to solve this problem. Reducing defense of security spending, which I think is right proposal, can create room for reforming education, health service, but not solving pension pro problem. Second, um, you correctly mentioned um, about uh, the rise of state monopolies of various kind and they, um, under Putin. So my question is what you are, what is your proposal to do this with this problem? Do you consider privatization, demonopolization, and for example, elimination, various restriction on foreign investment, which according to international experience is the most effective way to fight domestic oligarchy. And the third comment on constitution. I understand that parliamentary system is not perfect protection against authoritarian drift. This is enough to look at Hungary and Poland today. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I would say that it potentially includes more checks against rising of authorita uh, authoritarian power than the presidential system, presidential parliamentary system. So I am, I am not fully convinced by, by uh, other your proposals like decentralization, return, rebalancing between um, various branches of government sound convincing, but I, I am not fully sure that, that um, keeping the presidential system even in more, I would say, soft form is the, the right, right long-term solution, perhaps as transitory measure, yes, but, but thank you. Okay, first on the uh, demonopolization, we actually had published a couple of years ago, we published a very comprehensive report on that in, in much detail together with Khodorkovsky and Open Russia. It is publicly available. Uh, just please write me an email and I will send you a link. Uh, I suggest that, that you read it. And I also, uh, I have to comment on these constitutional issues in parliamentary public because I outlined in this brochure that we don't have a complete consensus. There is a consensus that the power should be devolved from the president to other branches. But I personally am not a supporter of parliamentary republic because this is not a guarantee at all against the power grab. And we had this experience in Russia in 93 because the conflict that we had in 93 was not between authoritarian Yeltsin and the free parliament. It was between two groups competing for uh, control, or ultimate control of power. Because if you read the constitution that was suggested by the Supreme Soviet in 93, it is far more authoritarian, it was fortunately never adopted, but it's far more authoritarian than what was adopted under Yeltsin in the end. They essentially wanted to abolish all the division of powers. So I personally do not think that we should uh, uh, permanently engage in this volleyball between presidential republic and the parliamentary republic. It's just not worth it. None of it will solve the problems. What we really need, and uh, many of the opposition leaders, including Navalny, with whom we talked about this at length, is we really need to show a political will to ensure that the division of powers is working. That is the recipe. Independent judiciary is independent judiciary. No one uh, inserts uh, their dirty hands into it, right? Uh, parliament should have more powers, and uh, the, the way the government is shaped should be clearly affected and done with the parliamentary consent and many other stuff. So I think the division is the recipe and uh, uh, not as much as uh, who gets supremacy, right? I wanted to say a few words about uh, Ukraine, uh, which is obviously a key issue, but I think there's there's like a 100% uh, consensus among the liberal opposition forces. We are all participants, uh, regular participants of uh, the anti-aggression and anti-war rallies that are held in Moscow. You may be uh, saw some pictures or videos about it uh, which were pretty sizable and we were among myself I was among uh, the organizers and actually I, uh, uh, I recently uh, on the Ukraine Independence Day uh, on August 24th I wrote a Facebook post about it where I actually say that it is a gift to Russia that we have such a beautiful and talented neighbor nation 
And uh, as a matter of fact, we've done a lot of bad stuff to Ukraine uh, for which we really feel guilty. I think there is absolute consensus that uh, we should do uh, everything possible to eliminate all these negative consequences of uh, Putin's aggression in Ukraine. And uh, uh, two things in, in uh, connection with that. First, if you take a look at how Russian television presents this whole Ukrainian crisis, and if you even take a look at the opinion polls, uh, you would see, no matter what you might hear, you would see that uh, this is not being presented by Putin as that we need to conquer. Uh, it is explained that we are helping the friendly neighboring nation, nation which is currently captured by some bad people. This is how Russian propaganda puts it. So the bottom line, majority of Russians do not support aggressive behavior. There is a clear proof of that. They think, because they've been brainwashed extensively by propaganda, that we are just there to help, which is totally out of line with reality. But the bottom line is that Russians are not aggressive against Ukraine. And point number two, I think we have a complete uh, consensus that uh, we should treat all neighbors as equals. We do not, we completely reject the concept of uh, establishing a like exclusive zone of Russian dominance and stuff. We should be equals, period. And we should all together uh, move on with the same aspirations for European integration and creating the same uh, free and prosperous uh, European space, peaceful uh, and uh, uh, delivering uh, good results to our, our peoples, right? And Marie, your question, uh, Putin, is hopeless. That's the formula. I'm a former bureaucrat. I spent six years in government, and I really do have a lot of friends and people whom I know in the system. The one, uh, well, Daniel, uh, have told an old Soviet joke comparing this to a present situation, but I think one of the distinctive features of the current situation from the Soviet Union is that even in the late Soviet times, you could still find some people who believed in communism. Uh, and who were like firmly devoted. I've been looking all over again for anybody in, in the system who actually believes that Putinism might work someday. Zero. There is nobody. Nobody in this system itself believes that it can deliver and work. They patiently wait, all of these officials who work there, they patiently wait for Putin to go, maybe even, uh, maybe even uh, they are even more unhappy about the situation than we are because we free people and they're under pressure every day, right? They, they, they probably want uh, Putin to go more than us, right? So that's, that's the very important, maybe some crazy Patrushev in the National Security Council is a very big fan of Putinism, right? And he gives his permanent interviews about that, but that's it, right? So uh, uh, everybody more or less understands that we need to wait until he goes. Uh, and okay, he's been, uh, we, we have already enough experience. He's been in power for too long to basically understand uh, what is his focus, how he behaves, what he believes in and what he doesn't. So I think it's uh, pretty clear that uh, he has to go uh, and it w it's a questionable whether the reforms would begin or not after he does, because we have examples of countries like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, which are fairly similar to our potential risky future when you had a change of leader, but no real change of system, right? But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Putin gone is a precondition for anything positive to emerge in Russia. Without, uh, with him staying in power, the flowers will not grow on this asphalt, right? That's, that's, uh, that's the thing. Uh, uh, we need, to, you know, uh, uh, I explained this at length yesterday at the Chatham House. Uh, uh, this issue is often discussed like there are two players, Putin and the opposition of some sort, or maybe several groups in the opposition, right? There's this sleeping giant in the room which had disconnected himse himself from participation, and this is where all problems originate. It's the Russian people, the Russian population. Putin's agreement with the Russian population was that they disconnect from politics. We need to bring them back. Because again, I, I answered Roland's question about the questionnaire. Each and every issue specific, you talk to Russian people, like 95% what Putin does, they don't like. That's, that's as simple as that. Even the Kremlin pollsters, even Tsuom would tell you that, right? So uh, we need to work with the population. We need to boost our movement. We need to enhance our media outreach. We need to work regions. This is what I am doing. This is what Navalny is, is doing and so on. It's a slow process, but look, I don't see any other dynamic. The dynamic 
is not good for Putin. Maybe not too fast, but eventually we will get there.